The House committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol will prepare to hold Mark Meadows in criminal contempt for not complying with the panel's subpoena. Meadows told the panel he would no longer appear for a deposition today. In a letter to Meadows, the committee's chairman writes, the select committee is left with no choice but to advance contempt proceedings and recommend the body in which Mr. Meadows once served refer him for criminal prosecution. For more on this, I want to bring in CBS News legal contributor Keir Dougal. Keir, welcome. Great to see you. Now, you know, Meadows was supposed to give a deposition to the committee today and changed his mind. What do we know about that? Because, of course, we know his cooperation was always somewhat limited, but this seemed to be a full sort of putting on the brakes, correct? That's correct. It, it appears that he doesn't want to answer questions now. The reasons, the broad reasons that he offered, his counsel offered to the committee were that the committee was behaving uh, pugnaciously, uh, was overbroad in its demands, and uh, that he, that Mr. Meadows wanted to uh, assert Mr. Trump's executive privilege. But if I can, just to put this in context, I'd like to offer a quote um, which goes, an inquiry will produce no great information if those whose conduct is examined are allowed to select the evidence. Now, you, your social studies teacher in 10th grade may not have covered this with you, Tanya, but this is a quote from the English Prime Minister William Pitt in 1741. So this playbook of subjects of an investigation to try to control the scope of an inquiry is... Uh, at least 280 years old. It is a, a very common uh, effort by uh, subjects to, uh, to try to limit uh, what they want to say. And it sort of raises the next question, which is, well, what are you trying to hide? Right, which is the whole point, I guess, of the inquiry, correct? So, uh, as you pointed out, so, um, Keir, the, the letter the committee sent to Meadows contains some new details about information he's already shared with the committee. What are some of the highlights? Yeah, so um, one of the things that uh, grabbed my attention was documents relating to proposed alternate slates of electors, right? So this gets us into the weeds a little bit, right? We we don't directly elect our president, we elect people who elect our president. And they're called slates of electors and they come from each state. And the way uh, our, our peaceful transition of power has worked for centuries is that the slates that were chosen through a direct, through a popular vote are the ones that are counted toward the president. Here, the reference to alternate slates of electors means slates that were cherry picked, hand picked, um, to support President Trump, either uh, most likely by um, le legislatures in states that were controlled by uh, the, the Republican Party, meaning that um, this specific reference is uh, it's, it's highly re it's highly relevant to the January 6 um, investigation of what the, the the insurrectionary plot might have been to overturn the results of the 2020 election. That's just one example. So that's pretty, I mean, I, you would know better than I would, but that sounds like pretty damning information, right? It's sort of direct evidence that they were trying to figure out a way of getting around uh, the election results? Well, it, it, we don't, right, the investigation is gonna figure out whether it's damning or not, who, who, who was naughty or nice, if anybody was. But that particular question is highly relevant to the effort to interfere on January 6th, which, as we know, was the, was the preceding, the moment when the Congress was actually uh, set to determine whether each state's electors were, were, uh, were validly uh, selected and which ones would be counted. This, that one goes to, the, to that particular issue, goes to the very core of our, our peaceful transfer of power and what has been reported, what we understand to have been the efforts by the insurrectionists to interrupt that process. Right, okay, so Keir, 
Getting back to Meadows, he would be the third former Trump official the committee has voted to hold in criminal contempt of Congress. Uh, does it appear that there may be more? And is there any way for Congress to get these officials to talk? Or at this point, by starting this process, is the committee essentially saying, we know we're putting you guys in a box over here, and we know that now you're going to have to go through this whole process, so we aren't going to hear from you until that's done, which means the committee doesn't necessarily need their testimony in the short term? So I would think that anybody that takes this same stance as Mr. Meadows, this completely, this uncooperative stance, uh, is placing themselves, um, uh, putting a, putting a, placing themselves in position to be referred for contempt by the Congress. Congress, as we've discussed before, has several options. The one that they're, we're discussing here with, res with respect to Mr. Meadows is a criminal referral. That one is kind of binary. It kind of, you know, it'll kind of put, as you say, Mr. Meadows in a box. We'll wait to see what happens. If he's convicted, um, I think the chances that he will turn over documents and cooperate are, are remote. If he's not convicted, obviously he's not going to cooperate. The, the Congress has other tools which are more targeted at, at getting cooperation, one of which is to actually send the House sergeant at arms out and arrest people who are not cooperating, and they would be held until they decided to cooperate or until the, the House um, retires. So they have other tools to, uh, you know, to put more pressure on these witnesses to, uh, to, to be cooperative. All right. Well, Keir Dougal, thank you so much for joining us. As always, we appreciate your legal expertise.